Come and see what everyone's talking about. La ilaha illallah. Allah. There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah. La ilaha illallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of the Dean Show. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. All praise and thanks to the creator of the heavens and earth who has given us this platform where we can share some of this wonderful knowledge with you. Now, our next guest has been with us before. He has his own section at thedeanshow.com. So, you got to hear his story. He is Dr. Gerald Dirks. We've invited him to come back on the show to talk about a very, very important topic. Now, just a little bit about Dr. Gerald Dirks. He is a former minister, a deacon, from the United Methodist Church. He had finished with a master's degree in divinity. He finished seminary school, and we're going to bring him out to help cover this topic about the crucifixion. Did God actually send himself or his son to die for the sins of the world? People want to know, is this the truth? Is this something that has supporting evidence behind it. So we're going to go back into some of the history to see the de did Jesus teach this, did the Bible teach this, did his companions teach this, and first and foremost, did God Almighty instruct us to believe this? Now, we'll be right back to cover this very important topic, to learn the truth so we can live the truth, and we'll be right back here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere. Deen. Allah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I did that. Maybe it's, just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Peace be unto you, brother. And to you, brother. All right. Most of the people already know who you are. They got to hear this wonderful story, how you came to accept the way of life of all the prophets, Islam. Now, today, if you can just spend a minute talking a little bit about some of your accomplishments. You went to actually attain your... Uh, Masters uh, in Divinity from Harvard University, you finished seminary school. Talk about this for a second before we go on to our topic. Well, in terms of educational background, I have a BA in philosophy from Harvard, mm -hmm. a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School, yeah. and then an MA in Doctorate in Psychology from the University of Denver in Clinical Psychology. You've authored a number of books. They're all sitting here. We've got about a half a dozen of them. We'll talk about that closer to, towards the end of the show. But here we want to get straight to the topic. Now, you're not some lay person who doesn't know the Bible. You were someone who was out there preaching Christianity, teaching Christianity. You really know this area well. So we want to know now, did God Almighty send Jesus to die for the sins of the world? Is there something that, is this something that is backed by historical evidence, evidence from the Bible. Can we talk about this now? Okay. Perhaps the base the place to start though is with what the Quran says yes. about the crucifixion. And uh, this is uh, the fourth chapter of the Quran, verses 157 and 158. And uh, let me just quote the English translation for you. They boasted, we killed Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary. However, they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him but it was made to appear to them that they did. Those who argue about it are full of doubts and have no concrete information. On the contrary, they only follow theories, for they certainly didn't kill him. Absolutely not. God raised Jesus up to himself, for God is powerful and wise. Now, for Christians, the typical Christian, the fact that the Quran says Jesus was not crucified, Mm -hmm. is probably the most difficult hurdle they have to make yes. in coming to either embrace Islam or to respect Islam. You know, Christians have been taught from the word go 
Jesus was crucified on Good Friday. He arose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. They're taught this from Sunday school on. And uh, they believe not only is this what they're taught in church, but this is a historical reality. This isn't just theological opinion. This is historical reality. There's an unblemished historical record saying that Jesus was crucified. In fact, if you look at a junior high uh, world history textbook, if it covers the Middle East, at some point it'll probably talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, as though this were a historical fact. Mm -hmm. The reality is, however, quite different than that assumption that most Christians make as to it being an historical fact. Outside of the New Testament and some other early Christian writing, yes. there are only two sources for a, a crucifixion of Jesus anywhere in the written records of the first and early second century. Only two. Only two. One by Josephus, a Jewish historian, the other by Tacitus, a Roman historian, neither of whom was present they weren't at the there. crucifixion. They didn't either. see it, they didn't witness no, it. No, they weren't. And for that matter, almost all biblical scholars maintain that none of the authors of the New Testament books were present at the crucifixion. So event. we got two historians writing about it. How much further away from the date were they writing about it? Well, the Gospel of Mark is, is probably the earliest of the four Gospels, and it was written somewhere between, say, 68 to 72, somewhere in that uh, time range, maybe 75. At the How many years is that after? This is a, the, almost uh, 40 years. 40 years later. Yeah, okay. after the, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And then the next Gospel would be? Next Gospel would probably be Matthew's, written uh, maybe around... Uh, 80, 85. So that's another, now we got 40 years away, yeah. then another one's 50, 60 years away? Well, we're, we're starting Six. to get 50 years. F Luke comes next, and, the, and then John. Earlier than that, however, would be the, uh, the epistles of Paul, or the letters of Paul. Earlier than the Gospels. Yeah, where, where he talks about the crucifixion event. But even there, we're, we're talking 10, 15 years removed okay. from the crucifixion event. And again, we're talking about people who weren't there. And how well, about just... This is all hearsay information. Yeah, like he said, she said kind of stuff. Yeah, I, you know, so-and-so said, uh, and I got the story from, etc. Only nowhere are we told the sources that these New Testament writers are using. Just before you go on, how many years later is Josephus and what's the other person? Uh, Tacitus. Tacitus. They're, they're, they're writing even somewhat later. Josephus is writing... Well, they're writing... Uh, Josephus is writing during the time the Gospels were put together. Around that time? Yeah. Okay. Late first century. Gotcha. Now, so the information's not there in terms of any first-hand account. However, the thoughtful Christian's going to say, okay, we, we have this information, it may be hearsay, but what is there to suggest that he wasn't crucified? Mm -hmm. that there's nothing in the historical record, they would say. And there's where they're wrong. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal in the historical record. A great deal. So, for example, the Jewish Talmud uh -huh. uh, says that Jesus was stoned to death, uh -huh. not crucified. So we have a great discrepancy in terms of mode of death. Now, Talmud, what is this for people who really aren't too versed in some of these names and books? Talmud. Okay. Uh, the Jewish written law was called the Torah. Okay. And then they, they also had the written prophets, the Nevi'im, and the, the written writings, the Ketuvim. These three together basically comprise uh, the uh, Protestant Old Testament. Uh -huh. Now, they also had what they called the Oral Law of Moses, which they said was passed on from scribe to scribe to scribe. Yeah. And wasn't written down until the Mishnah, which would be in the second century. Mm -hmm. uh, and then commentaries on the Mishnah were written and put with the Mishnah, and together, the Mishnah and the commentaries, or the Gemara, are known as the Talmud. Okay, so you have these two come up, and this is the Talmud now. Yes. Mishnah and the commentaries of... Yeah, on the, the Mishnah. On the Mishnah, that's the Talmud. Yeah. Okay. And they say... He was, he was stoned to death. Okay. But it's not just the Jewish group that we can turn to for counter-suggestions. It also exists within early Christianity, and it exists quite strongly within early Christianity. Early Christianity. Yeah. Yes, and there's three sources we can go to for this. One is the writings of the early church fathers. 
Secondly, we can look at what's called the so-called apocryphal books of the New Testament, mm -hmm. or New Testament apocrypha. And thirdly, we can look at the New Testament itself. Mm -hmm. Because all three suggest that there were Christian groups that did not believe in the crucifixion, that rejected that concept. All three question whether a crucifixion took place. So let's, let's start with the, the church fathers yes. on this. And, uh, you know, amongst the early church fathers in the first couple of centuries, we have Ignatius, we have Polycarp, we have Justin, we have Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Hippolytus, all writing that there were Christian groups that rejected the concept of the crucifixion. Now, of course, they were attacking these groups. Mm -hmm. That's how we know about them. Uh, but we can look at a couple of these groups. We know something about a couple of them. One are the so-called Docetists. This was a Gnostic Christian group. Uh, they didn't believe that Jesus actually had a physical body. Yeah. And so he couldn't possibly have actually been crucified or died on a cross. However, the really interesting group is a group that was very active in the second century in Egypt called the Basilideans. And they maintained that Simon of Cyrene was crucified in place of Jesus. Now, most Christians who are familiar with their Gospels will know that all the, the Gospels say that at one point as Jesus was carrying his cross to Golgotha, he stumbled and fell. Mm -hmm. And the Roman soldiers grabbed someone out of the crowd and had him carry the cross the rest of the way. And that person's identified as being Simon of Cyrene. This is what this group is saying now. No, this is in the Gospels this of the is New in the Testament. Gospel. The New Simon Testament. of Cyrene carried the cross to Golgotha for Jesus yeah. after he stumbled carrying it. Uh -huh. Now this group, the Basilideans said, we received it directly from Glaucus, who was the translator for Simon Peter, one of the twelve disciples, that Simon of Cyrene was crucified in place of Jesus. When that switch was made and Simon was made to carry the cross, he was the one who ended up being crucified. Mm -hmm. So this was a very prominent Christian group in second century Egypt, maintaining Jesus wasn't crucified, Simon of Cyrene was. Also, if we look at the so-called New Testament apocryphal writings, we find the two books of Jew, which go back to about the third century in Egypt, say Jesus wasn't crucified. The Apocalypse of Peter, going back to, again to the third century, says Jesus wasn't crucified. The Acts of John, going back to the first half of the second century, pretty early, says Jesus wasn't crucified. And then the, two, uh, the second treatise of the great Seth, also going back into the second century. Now what books are these? The, these mentioned? are uh, books that didn't make it into the New Testament, but which at one time or another, one or another Christian groups considered to be scripture. But who's deciding now what makes it and what breaks it? What is to be put in and what is to be put out? Well, th this was a long decision in Christianity, and uh, this will get us sidetracked into a whole long discussion, yeah. which maybe we can better have later. Mm -hmm. But suffice it to say, what finally comprised the New Testament took centuries and is not resolved even till today. Yeah. There are Christian branches of Christianity even today that have different New Testaments than other branches of Christianity. A fact that's not known by most Christians. Yeah. But anyway, we have all these books saying Jesus wasn't crucified. But perhaps the most interesting, the mm -hmm. most interesting thing, raising serious questions about the crucifixion, comes from the Bible itself. Yeah. And I'm just going to reach over here and grab a copy of the Bible. And what version of the Bible is This that? is the New Revised Standard Version. Mm -hmm. I'm using this version because the translators go back to the earliest existing manuscripts in most cases mm -hmm. in order to do their translations. Unlike, say, something like the King James Bible, which uh, goes to a fairly late Greek manuscript. Now, when you say it goes back to the earliest manuscripts, is this anything original, or is this a copy of a copy of something Well, it's, it's the earliest that we have, typically. Earliest that we have. Yeah. So, but is this something original, something that is... Well, uh, we, we don't have any <laughs> anything that was penned by the actual author. So nothing that actually Jesus is writing himself? No. Or Moses, no. or any of these? No, we don't no, have that. We okay. don't have it. 
But first, let me, let me read to you just a little bit. This is from the 27th chapter of Matthew. And this is from the old King James Version, with which probably most Christians are familiar. And Jesus has been arrested uh, by Roman soldiers. Uh, yes. And he's brought uh, before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, to stand trial. And we're told in Matthew that Pilate is, really doesn't want to do anything to Jesus. Uh -huh. And he sees a way out. He's, he's got another prisoner there. And he decides since the Passover is coming up, he'll release one of the two, just as a gesture of mercy. And he gives the crowd a choice, we're told in Matthew. And um, we're told that uh, this is, again, the King James Version, which is much older. Uh, has a much uh, later uh, Greek text that it's using. And uh, according to this, uh, Pilate said to the crowd, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? That's verse 17 of chapter 27. And later we're told that the crowd said, Give us Barabbas. Mm -hmm. And Pilate released Barabbas and Jesus, who is called the Christ, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah, mm -hmm. was taken away and crucified. Yes. Uh, but now when we go to the New Revised Standard Version, we have something that reads just a little differently. It's a crucial one-word change. Mm -hmm. But to get the whole thrust of this, uh, I'm going to read a number of verses here because I want people to understand the context. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Notice, this is the charge that's been made against this man. Yes. That you're claiming to be king of the Jews. Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge. So the governor was greatly annoyed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. Mm -hmm. Note, Barabbas' name is Jesus. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? Now, this is out of the Revised Standard yes, Version. Yes, this is right out of the, of the Bible, New Revised Standard Version, 27th chapter of Matthew. We have two people named Jesus. Mm -hmm. So who's who? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at two key words, Messiah and Barabbas. Mm -hmm. Now, Messiah simply means the anointed. That's all it means. Many Christians labor under the misconception that there was only one Messiah, and that was Jesus. Are there many other Messiahs oh, in the many Bible? many Messiahs mentioned in the Bible. However, the Bible translators translate the term, and they say, the anointed. But almost anywhere you look in the Old Testament where it talks about the anointed, the word that's being translated is Messiah. Yes. Okay. But when they talk about Jesus, they don't translate it. Mm -hmm. They use the term Messiah or the Greek equivalent Christ. So two people named Jesus. Who were the anointed of Israel? That's the key question here in understanding Messiah. And basically, we know from history, there were three groups that were the Messiahs or the anointeds of Israel. One, prophets, occasionally. Two, the high priests of Israel, or of Judaism. And, and we know that this Jesus was not one of the high priests because we have the list of high priests from Josephus. And three, the king of Israel, mm -hmm. or someone claiming to be the king of Israel. Yeah. And note the charge that was made against Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Yeah. Okay. So, that's Messiah. Now, what about Jesus Barabbas? Here's where it gets really interesting. Barabbas is not a name. Barabbas is a patronymic meaning the son of so-and-so. In Aramaic, bar means the son of. So we have Jesus, the son of Abbas. But it gets more interesting. Abbas is not a name either. It's a noun. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and it needs to be translated. Bible translators aren't quite willing to do this yet, so they keep using the word Barabbas. Mm -hmm. But if we translate bar Abbas, we get son of the father. So we have Jesus who is called the anointed, apparently claiming to be king of the Jews, and we have Jesus, the son of the father. Pilate gives the crowd a choice. The choice says, give us the son of the father. Pilate releases Jesus, the son of the father. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, the anointed, apparently claiming to be king of the Jews, is crucified. Now, any Christian listening will realize Jesus, the son of the father, sounds very much like the Jesus with whom we're all interested both Christians and Muslims. Yes. And the Bible says he was set free. Set free by Pilate. This might explain why the Coptic Christian church canonized Pilate as a saint. Mm -hmm. You know, do you justify sainthood for the man who condemned Jesus or for the man who saved him and set him free? Yeah. Now, the fact that the person who was crucified, the Jesus who was crucified, was claiming to be the king of the Jews or king of Israel is uh, to be found in many places in the Gospels. We're told in uh, Matthew, um, that uh, on the cross, uh, Pilate had placed above Jesus' head, King of the Jews. We're told the same thing in Mark. We're told the same thing in Luke, etc. You know, so we have plenty of New Testament biblical information that this person who was crucified was seen as a threat to Rome in that he was claiming to be a king. Mm -hmm. Tell us now for some of the verses that someone reads that Jesus, they say that he came back from the dead and then he had shown his hands that he had been crucified or he had what appeared to be, you know, how, how do you uh, tackle this? Well, for one thing, it's, uh, it's uh, the thing about show me your hands, etc., is uh, medically and scientifically um, illogical. Yeah. When a person was crucified, there was no nail put through the hand. Mm -hmm. If you put a nail here and hang somebody, it's just going to rip through. The weight of the body will pull the nail through, ah. you know, and the person's hand and arm will be uh, set free. Yeah. You know, the nail was put down here in the wrist between two bones so that it couldn't slip. So if Doubting Thomas, as we're told in the Bible, is looking at a wound in the palm of the hand, which is what the Bible says, it's nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Romans would never put a nail through the palm of the hand. It would be here. Yeah. If they even nailed, often they just strapped them. Mm -hmm. to the cross. How about him coming back now and saying, appearing at the Last Supper? And how, well, the, the Last Supper was before the crucifixion. Even. Oh, I mean, when he came back and he, the tomb and all these other pieces of the puzzle. Well, again, we have no first-hand accounts. Mm -hmm. we, we only have hearsay from many years later. Interestingly, the Gospel of Mark actually ends before any resurrection a scenario, though a number of verses were added on to the end of the last chapter of Mark to create such a story. Now we see that consistently if you look to the message that we believe that it has been the same, that God has sent mm -hmm. messengers and he has called the people to his way, which is to surrender and submit to the one God. Yes. Do we see anything leading up to this belief that the messengers were giving this news of God sending himself or a son to die for the sins of the world. Do we have this teaching at all? Well, because I don't think God wants to confuse us. <laughs> Christians will, will typically point to a couple of different verses. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them that they will typically point to is from the 12th chapter of Matthew, uh, verses uh, 38 through 40. Mm -hmm. And the verses read like this. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, and the teacher here is Jesus, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, 
but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. And Christians will point to this and say, see, mm -hmm. you know, we have Jesus himself prophesizing yeah. that he's going to be crucified and spend three days in the tomb. Yeah. Uh, now the key thing I'd point out to Christians here is actually read what the verse says. So for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. We're told in the Bible Jesus was crucified on Friday mm -hmm. during the day. Yeah. And he arose Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Friday during the day, Friday at night. Saturday during the day, Saturday at night. Maybe Sunday during the day, depends when exactly he arose. But there's absolutely no way we get three days in the or three nights in the tomb. Most Christians never stop to think about that. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. Because you can't get three days and three nights out of the story of, of the crucifixion event. Is there something clear, not something that's equivocal, that's open to different interpretations, something clear that Jesus said, look, I am God, Son of God, coming to die for your sins, believe in me, and you, you, you got this ticket to paradise. Something clear, I need something clear, if I'm going to submit myself to that, not something ambiguous, is there anything clear, please, Dr. Uh, well, let me Gerald. give you something clear. Uh, and this is very clear and it's very decisive. Uh, but it doesn't answer the way you're saying. Uh -huh. And this is from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 3. This is a prayer, we're told, that Jesus is saying, and it's taking place before any crucifixion event. And let me quote verse 3 and 4 from that prayer for you. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Done, huh? Done. Over with. Before any crucifixion. This is before all these events now. Yes. Jesus is saying, I finished it. And before any crucifixion. By these words, if you accept. Where is that verse now? This is John 17, verses 3 through 4. Mm -hmm. If you accept, John as being part of the Bible, if you accept that Jesus said these words, he himself has ruled out there being any crucifixion, any atonement in the blood, etc. So we don't have Jesus ever <coughs> saying, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, that he was coming to die for the sins of the world. No, not really. Nothing. Nothing clear. No. Okay. We're going to... Can we do a part two? This yeah. is very interesting. I got a few more questions I want to ask you. We're almost out of time. But just now, if something happens to someone and he travels far away, he doesn't get to see part two, which we're going to have, inshallah, God willing, at the deanshow.com under the special section that our brother here, Dr. Gerald Dirks, has along with his story. Tell us, real briefly, what should someone do who's been believing this? They felt like this is their one-way ticket now that if they believe in Jesus, he's dying for their sins, that they got paradise. What is the proper belief? And what should someone do now if he's a little confused now? Give us some advice. Well, you know, I think most Christians try to hold on to this notion that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to die for our sins. And this was a great act of, of love. I would point out to those people that Islam promotes an even greater understanding of love. Because in Islam, God has always loved humanity. There wasn't a time of original sin where God couldn't listen to humanity and grant humanity its prayers. God in Islam does not demand a blood sacrifice in order to be able to forgive us. All that he asks for us, for him to forgive us, is that we sincerely repent and that we ask for forgiveness. No need for a blood sacrifice, simply sincere repentance from a believer. I would submit that this is a much more loving, uh, a vision of a much more loving God than one that uh, demands a blood sacrifice on a cross. It, it makes a lot more sense and I'm sure there's a lot more evidence to back it up, and we're going to cover that, inshallah. God willing, on part two. Can we do part two? God willing. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
And thank you for tuning in. I'm sorry we're out of time. I know you're excited, but we're going to have him back to do this, and we'll continue this next week, inshallah. We're going to be talking about the crucifixion, continue to give evidence to show you what actually is the truth and the way of life that all the messengers of God taught, and that was that submission and surrender to the one God, that this Creator is the most just. He didn't attach us with this stigma of original sin. We were all born in original goodness, and we're going to be talking about this, how the Creator of the heavens and earth is the most loving and the, merc the most merciful, as you heard our guests say, that He doesn't need a blood sacrifice. You just need to give it your best, and you got it in you. Turn to Him alone and ask Him to forgive you. He's the most forgiving. And we're going to, inshallah, be covering part two on this crucifixion. Until next time, we'll see you. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Let's see what everyone's talking about. Prove. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is, you do your best. Give up for spring God is one. I will never give up spreading this message. I hope that you take that necessary step. You don't know if you're going to live till tomorrow. So you got to find that urgency to do the right thing right now. The, the reality of life usually doesn't sink in until tragedy comes. You get a few bad people, the media grabs a hold of that and spends it the way they want to. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It has attended our faith to... Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which is a greeting of peace. Peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. Today my guest is a former Christian deacon minister, graduated with honors from Harvard University with a master's in divinity, finished seminary school, amongst other things, and we're continuing. This is part two. We're talking about the crucifixion. Did God send himself as a son to die for your sin, for my sins? Is there evidence for this? Did the prophets of old teach this? Should we believe it? We're going to be talking about this when we come back for was God crucified? Was Jesus crucified? Part 2. If you didn't see part 1, go back to thedeanshow.com under the special section that we have with our brother, Dr. Gerald Dirks. And we'll be right back to cover this very important topic. Allah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah. La ilaha illallah Allah There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah La ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Peace be unto you, my brother. And to you, brother. Thank you for being with us. My, my pleasure. We don't want the time to run out like it's been running out. <laughs> we start getting into these very important topics. Next thing you know, they're flagging us. We're almost out of time, so we're going to get straight to it. Many people already know who you are. You graduated from Harvard University. You finished seminary school. At Harvard. At Harvard. And Harvard actually named you a holistic scholar, signifying that you were one of the top pre-theology students in that college. Correct. Yes. You were filling pulpits at churches, at nursing homes, at various churches. You were, uh, at a young age, started off as a youth minister. Mm -hmm. I mean, y you pretty much, you know this topic well. And inshallah, God willing, you're going to help clear up some fog because there's some controversy over this. Now, tell us, to recap kind of what we, and bring up people to speed who didn't see part one, you can go back to the mm -hmm. Dean Show to see part one. Tell us, you talked about... Josephus, the early historians, and some of the Gospels, just bring the people up to speed on what we covered before, before we move forward. Well, basically, if, if you look at the origins of early Christianity, you'll find that there were a number of different early Christian groups that adamantly denied that Jesus was ever crucified. We know this by looking at the writings of the so-called Apostolic Fathers. We know this by looking at the so-called New Testament Apocrypha. 
uh, where in many places it's said that Jesus was not crucified. So, for example, the second treatise of the great Seth says that Simon of Cyrene was crucified in place of Jesus. Simon of Cyrene being the one that the Gospels tell us uh, was made to carry Jesus' cross after he stumbled while carrying it. But also, within the New Testament itself, we see that there's a great deal of question mark as to which person was actually crucified. If you look at the New Revised Standard Version of Matthew, chapter 27, which goes back to some of the earliest Greek sources we have in terms of this particular passage of Matthew, we see that Pilate offered the crowd of choice between releasing one of two prisoners, Jesus, who was called the Messiah, which just means the anointed, or Jesus Barabbas. And as we went through the steps last time, the anointed probably meant, or Messiah, the anointed, probably meant this was someone claiming to be king of the Jews or king of Israel. In fact, that's what uh, Pilate asked him to begin with, and that's what's put over uh, his head on the cross, according to all four of the New Testament Gospels, king of the Jews. The other Jesus, Jesus Barabbas, and we noted that the New Testament translators are not translating Barabbas because Barabbas is not a name. It's a patronymic, meaning the son of. Mm -hmm. And if we translate Bar, son of, Abbas, father, we have Jesus, the son of the father, and we're told right there in Matthew that Pilate released Jesus, the son of the father, and another Jesus who was claiming to be king or Messiah was crucified. So, who was crucified? There was a great deal of confusion in the early church. Many early Christian groups denied that Jesus was ever crucified. This wasn't something like across the board that everybody was, there was a consensus, a ijma, that everyone was like, look, this is a historical fact that he was indeed crucified. No, there was a great deal of controversy as to whether or not he was actually crucified. That actually goes along with what the verbatim Word of God, the Quran, is saying, that yes. there's much conjecture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, this is one of those passages, I think, where you read it and, and you say, how, how could an illiterate 7th century Arab have known this? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't in any history books that he had access to. And even if he had access to them, he wouldn't have been able to have read them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, this is one of those places where you look at the Quran and you say, wow. It's just one of the signs out of the many that proves that this is indeed revelation from the yeah. creator of the heavens and the earth. For those who are sincere, we are not trying to upset anybody or hurt nobody's feelings, but the truth, we're trying to present it in a very academic way, in a sincere way, so it can be clear. And all we ask is that you have an open heart and an open mind to be able to decipher analytically. Is this really, is there some substance to what we're saying? Now tell us, very clearly, also, before we ended last time, I asked you, I said, is there something unequivocal, not something ambigu ambiguous, like I think you mentioned once before where, what do they call it in psychology, where they'll give you a card in front of you, what's it called? A Rorschach test. A Rorschach test? Yes, an test. And, and, and this is, a, tell us, this is something where they put a card in front of you and say, okay, what, what do you see here? It's like a yeah. painting maybe, and you say, okay, what do you see here? And the person says, I see a balloon. Another person says, I see a cloud. Another person says, something where it's not like that, where no. people can't like deduct what they, their desires want them to deduct or what they've been passed down from. Something clear where he said, look, I am God and the Son of God whatever, and I'm coming to die for your sins. Accept me as your Savior, and you will have paradise. Straightforward no. to the point. No, no. We, we can't find this in the words of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament. Basically, where this is starting to come from is, yeah, is where from is Paul. It's coming from Paul. And Pauline Christianity. Was yes. he a disciple? Was he someone no. that saw Jesus, walk with Jesus? No. or No, no. no. As, as far as we know, Paul never even met the earthly Jesus. Now, sometime after the end of Jesus' ministry, and, and I put it that way, the end of his earthly ministry, because in Islam, we believe, like Christians, that Jesus ascended into heaven. He was taken up into heaven. The difference is we believe he wasn't crucified. He didn't die. Mm -hmm. He was taken up while still alive. But uh, Paul was persecuting Christians. Mm -hmm. He was a, a Jewish rabbi. He was persecuting Christians, and on his way to the road, uh, on the road to Damascus, 
where he was going to persecute an early Christian group, he supposedly saw a vision of the risen Jesus. Yeah. And uh, this was his claim to discipleship, that the risen Jesus had communicated to him. Uh, but having ever met the historical Jesus, no, no. So Paul began to preach a very different type of Christianity than what was going on among the actual disciples of Jesus as they continued to worship in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. I'm trying to give just something for the lay person that he can understand because we, the information you gave is it's very academic. And mm -hmm. those people who are also possibly thinking of going to seminary school, mm -hmm. people who are the academia and intellectuals, they know what you're saying. They know that Bible. Mm -hmm. Now the layman, I'm trying to also get to where he can understand where A, Jesus clearly never taught this crucifixion. Okay. Another thing is, did Moses, did the first man, prophet Adam, no, did he, Moses, Noah, did any of the prophets of God, did they ever come teaching that, look, this man is coming, God is coming, get ready to die for the sins of the world? No. Now, Christians may look back at certain passages in, in the book of Isaiah called the suffering servants mm -hmm. and say, well, this is Jesus, the suffering servant who's coming to die for our sins. But, you know, th that passage had always been interpreted by the Jews as, as referring to the nation of uh, the Jewish nation as a whole, yeah, yeah. the Jewish people as a whole, not to any one particular person. So, no, there's nothing that's unambiguous. The only thing that's unambiguous is the verse from the 17th chapter of John that I quoted to you on the last show, where Jesus is praying and is praying before any crucifixion event. And in his prayer, he says to God, I finished the work that you gave me to do. This is from the 17th chapter of John in the Bible. Now, if you accept that John accurately recorded Jesus' words, Jesus himself is saying quite unambiguously, my mission is over. My ministry is over. I've done everything God asked me to do, which means crucifixion event, that's totally outside the parameters of Jesus' mission and ministry. I was told or I heard in the Bible somewhere it says that, was it God saying or Jesus, the mighty messenger you guys said, that I did not or I don't need sacrifice, I came with mercy? Well, I, I don't know exactly which verse you're, you're referring to. Uh, well, it, God doesn't need sacrifice. Ju ju Judaism had uh, traditionally practiced sacrifice. Uh -huh. um, the whole temple cult yeah. in Jerusalem was geared around the priestly sacrifice uh -huh. that was given to God. Yes. Um, so this was a fundamental part of, of Judaism at it that was? time. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, tell us now, okay, so we don't have Jesus teaching this crucifixion. We don't have the prophets now, the disciples, let's move on to those that knew Jesus, who hung out with Jesus, who prayed with Jesus. Did they teach this? We have no uh, text written by any disciple. Um, you know, the Gospel of Matthew was not written by the disciple Matthew. In fact, the Gospel of Matthew didn't even get the name Matthew associated with it until around the year 130, I think it was. Whole Hold on, hold on. There's a bunch of people, thousands probably, who just heard you say Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew wasn't written by Matthew? No, of course not. Is that a fact? You, now, you finished at Harvard, you have a doctorate in divinity, master's in divinity, the, you know the Bible, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are those the authors? Those, those, those people names, think that the disciples wrote these books. No, the, those names weren't even associated with the original Gospels. Like I said, uh, Matthew... Uh, the gospel we call Matthew, was first attributed to the disciple Matthew uh, by an early bishop around the year 120, 130, something like that. And even at that, what we're told by that bishop is that uh, the disciple Matthew wrote the sayings of Jesus in a Hebrew original. Mm -hmm. And people have latched on to that and said, well, see, that's uh, the gospel of Matthew. But that's even tenuous at best. And, and that's many, many years after the fact that we have this first mention of a disciple's name 
in, in association with one of the four Gospels. So Jesus never taught this. The prophets of God Almighty never taught this. His disciples never preached or taught this. But you have one man that you mentioned, Paul, who actually taught this. This is basically where it's coming from. It's coming from him? Yeah, and from Pauline Christianity, the people uh -huh. who took Paul's teachings and, and ran with them and developed them even further. But yeah, from, from Pauline Christianity, basically. And, you know, in the book of Acts, you may find something attributed to one of the disciples teaching about uh, a crucifixion event. But again, the book of Acts is Pauline Christianity, and it's written from a very uh, pronounced Pauline bias. Do we have the original Bible? Do we have the original copies of the New Testament, the Old Testament? What are we looking no. at? We don't? What are these then? No, no. Uh, well, the, the, we, we don't have any original. Nothing original? No, there's nothing original. So is it safe to say like one Bible scholar, a Dr. Bart Aram, he said, we don't have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of yeah, anything original? Well, we have copies of copies of copies, but along the way we know those copies have been altered in places. Uh -huh. this is but, but there's nothing original. In a court of law, yeah. and you know how the law works here, mm -hmm. if you were to try to present this and use this as evidence in a court of law, would this work? No. It wouldn't? No, it's all hearsay. Now, if I took my driver's license, let's say you took, just to give a visual example, because, I mean, you know, some people, you know, we, we just really don't understand, you know, the importance of this. Now, if I took my, my driver's license, for mm -hmm. instance, and now I photocopied it, mm -hmm. all right, can, can, can this, is this like kind of what we have? You photocopied it, and then you change maybe my height, and then you photocopied it again, and then you change maybe my weight, and you photocopied it, you change my eye color, and you photocopied it, and then you photocopied it maybe a hundred times, and then you lost that original copy. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Well, yes, but let, let me add one thing. Some of those changes are probably inadvertent. Uh -huh. They were made by uh, a scribe's copying error. Okay. Um, some of them were intentional. Yeah. Some of them were to try and prove a certain theological point that the Bible was altered. Uh, in a particular way, at a particular time, at a particular place. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not our fault. It's not no, your fault. No. It's not the sincere person who might have been going by the Bible. But at what point do you have to stop now? And what is, we want to throw a lifeline now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's our motive here? Why are we doing this? Are we trying to upset somebody? And I told the people that we're not. Tell us, where do they go now? Because somebody might have really, you know, expected a seat in paradise believing this. What do they do now? They're confused, possibly. Oh, quite, quite possibly. But, but once one gets uh, past the, the point that, you know, there was tremendous controversy in early Christianity as to whether or not Jesus was crucified. That's point one. Point two, even if he was, had been crucified, what does it mean? You know, this whole notion of atonement in the blood is something that basically was developed by Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, and in part, he developed it because he was trying to do away with the Jewish law. Yeah. The the so-called laws of Moses governing dietary restrictions, etc. And he grabbed hold of a verse back in Deuteronomy which says that uh, Deuteronomy is one of the books supposed of the supposed Torah. Uh-huh. And and the verse says uh, anyone who's hung from a tree is cursed. Yeah. And Paul basically looked at that and said, "Oh my goodness, Jesus was hung on a cross, you know, he's cursed. Oh, of course, he was cursed to remove from us the curse of the law. Yeah. So we no longer have to fulfill these dietary requirements. We no longer have to be circumcised, etc., because uh, Jesus uh, took this curse on himself by hanging uh, on the cross and, and being cursed for us. So what does a person do now? Where do they go? How, I mean, is because people are taught now that Adam was cursed, and this curse, God cannot accept someone coming to him because of this sin. Well, we, we need to keep in mind here that the, this concept of original sin, mm -hmm. that somehow all of humanity has inherited Adam's and Eve's original sin uh, through the sexual act, we're told by some of the church fathers. Yeah. Um, that this notion is something that is found only in Western Christianity. It doesn't exist in Eastern Christianity. 
in the Orthodox Church, etc. No, cetera. no, no. This is strictly a Western Christian phenomenon. Doesn't exist in Judaism either. Mm -hmm. And of course, it doesn't exist in Islam. Yeah. Why would someone be punished for what his great, 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 how many times great grandfather did? Mm -hmm. um, you know, logically, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. No. I mean, it's kind of like if I asked somebody, I said, look, if the government came to get you for something that your great, 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 great yeah. grandfather did, yes. you'd be like, hold on, this is ludicrous. Absolutely. But the most merciful, just God, yes. who created us and who is, you know, merciful where we can't even imagine, yeah. why would he do this to us? An innocent baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it the belief that a child, now I, I was told, if, correct me, I'm just trying to learn, that a child, if that child is not baptized, if a child dies, does that child go to hell? The, the, no. Um, the traditional teaching of the Roman Catholic Church yeah. is that uh, a baby who dies before being baptized, right after birth, for example, will, will go to limbo, Okay. Uh, which is sort of this amorphous place where yeah. only these stillborn babies and, and uh, babies who died before baptism go. But certainly they teach to go to heaven, you have to be baptized. Yeah. Yeah. What, so that's the, you said the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah. What about the Protestant? Protestant churches don't have concepts like limbo. And uh, some Protestant uh, churches will, will say, you know, it says in the New Testament, Jesus says, uh, uh, suffer the little children to come unto me. Yeah. Uh, such will be the kingdom of heaven. And they look at verses like this and they say, ah, you know. Children are innocent. We, 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 we just got some problems here. It's a lot of ambiguity. It's a lot of confusion. But I think that the way of life that was sent for all of mankind, that submission, surrender, sincere obedience, sincerity, mm -hmm. and doing this all in peace. One word sums it up, Islam, yeah. which was practiced by all the prophets. Mm -hmm. They never taught this. What did they actually teach? The prophets? Yes. Well, they taught basically that one uh, approaches God uh, with sincere repentance, that this is all that's needed in order for God to forgive and extend His mercy to us. That's it. We don't need a blood sacrifice. Uh, stop and think about it for a moment. Mm -hmm. Let, let's assume for a moment that there is this original sin yeah. that we all inherit. And, and let me ask you a theoretical question, brother. Ask me, please. Suppose you entered into a contract. Mm -hmm. Now, a fancy name for a contract is a covenant. Covenant. Okay, you entered into a, a contract with a group of people out here. And you fulfilled your end of the, the contract. You provided everything you said you, that you were going to provide. But they, they reneged. Mm -hmm. They didn't uh, follow through and provide back to you what they said they were going to. And you kept asking them to. You kept asking them to. And they kept, no, no, no. And so finally he said, well, I'm going to give them one last chance to fulfill their end of the contract. Because, you know, I, I just can't forgive them yeah. for, for reneging on their end of the contract. And so you take your son and you send your son to them. And he says, come on, fulfill your end of the contract. And their response is that they kill your son. Mm -hmm. And now you can forgive them? Doesn't make sense even. Okay, but isn't this what the story of atonement and the blood is all about? Yeah. That God supposedly sends his supposed son, and he can't, has not been able to forgive mankind because of their original sin. But now that mankind kills his son, he can forgive them. You know, what, what kind of a theology is this? It's like kind of, I mean, that father, you know, he pushes his son in front of the car. Yeah. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. There's no evidence, like you said, no. behind it. There's some things that you can deduct and you can, you know, some ambiguity. And there's a lot of, like the verbatim Word of God said, there is, as that verse, which is chapter 4, 157, 158, yeah. which says that they only follow conjecture. Exactly. We're almost out of time. Tell us, I've heard the argument. And how would you explain this, refute this, where someone says, then why would God deceive us by letting us believe that Jesus died. Have you heard this? No, I haven't. But, but God doesn't deceive us. God mm -hmm. never deceives us. We only deceive ourselves. Deceive ourselves. You know, mankind is quite adept at deceiving mankind, right. whether it's one man deceiving another man or whether it's one person deceiving himself. 
Uh, we're very good at that. But God never deceives mankind. No. Never. I don't think it's hard to believe now because even today, you have politicians, you have people, and what a lot of times move people who aren't just and honest is power and money. Mm -hmm. Did you have a lot of that going on at that time? So you can kind of <laughs> see where, you know, uh, th uh, the truth can kind of get bent and texts can get changed? Well, well certainly uh, texts were changed at times for theological reasons. Yeah. Certainly politics had a great deal to do with some of the decisions that came out of some of the early uh, church councils, etc. Yeah. I was, uh, when you read and study the history, if there's any truth to this, where you'll see that the Greeks also at that time, they used to worship Apollo, the son of Jupiter, is it? And then you had a lot of the sacrifice that they, they were also doing to these gods, and you had mm -hmm. a, a Mithras, was it? That kind of was also born, died, had a son. and Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there, there was a common theme in Middle Eastern religions about a uh, dying and regenerating fertility god. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Where, uh, you know, the fertility god would die seasonally and then be regenerated in the spring and uh, the ground would once again become fertile, etc. You know, we have sort of the same thing in Greek mythology with Demeter and Persephone, uh, where she spends. Uh, the winter in Hades, and so it becomes cold and nothing will grow. Mm -hmm. And then the summer or the spring, she comes back to earth and things grow again. But th this notion of a dying and regenerating fertility god was very common in the Middle East uh, at the time of, of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. uh, we have notions of a dying, regenerating god in the Osiris myth in Egyptian uh, mythology as well. Seems like someone really has to be sincere because this is, see, I know one thing, my field is, uh, I train people in martial arts, mm -hmm. and there's no easy way. You got to work for what you want. Yeah. Now, there's no magic pill that you take, and now you're this complete martial artist, or you take this magic pill and you lose 200 pounds, <laughs> but it seems like you know, people always like that easy way. Yeah, yeah. They always sign up for those easy programs. Yes. And the other people that know the business, they know some people are profiting off this, mm -hmm. the weakness of the human being, always wanting the easy way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is one of those catches that, you know what's easy? I got the JC Gold Card, I call it, and you just charge it on, put it on Jesus' back. Do you see that this is one of those things where people just, out of being kind of not wanting to investigate, not wanting to look forward, that they just take this easy way and just roll with it? I, th I think that's probably true of some people. Yeah. I wouldn't say that's true of everyone who accepts it. But uh, certainly I think there's a danger in people saying, I believe in Jesus, I accept the gift of his crucifixion and his sacrifice for me, and that's my get-out-of-jail card, yeah. or my get-out-of-hell card, if you will. And so having accepted that, now I can basically do anything I want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it almost boils down to that, yeah. uh, that one's behavior is of no consequence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. if, if you have this faith, as, as they would define it, then you're home free. The correct thing now that you can give advice, again, before we close and we talk about some of your books real quick, that person who is sincere and honest and he's not wanting to get into the polemics mm -hmm. and that, he just wants to do what God wants him to do. Yeah. Well, as you were saying, there's no easy way. One basically has to study. Um, and uh, for, for Christians, study your Bible. And when I say study your Bible, first of all, I would urge you to go get a copy of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible if you don't already have it. Because it typically goes back to, not the originals, because we don't have the originals, but to the oldest texts yeah. that we still have. Uh, and secondly, get yourself a very good Bible commentary to help you understand what you're reading in the Bible and to provide helpful background information. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, the Interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible. came out around 1971 or 74. Um, and that's a very helpful one. It's a huge, thick thing. Um, but study. This is what you have to do if you want to try and get to the truth. Study, and the other thing I would say, pray on it. Pray on it. Simple. Don't don't pray for a specific answer. Pray to God. Simply 
to make it clear to you yeah. what the truth That's is. That's simple. You know, don't try and skew it. Don't say, God, please prove this to me. Simply say, God, please make it clear to me what the truth is. That's simple. In which one of these books now? you got a few of them mm -hmm. that covers this a little more in detail. The Crucifixion Event, uh, two books do. Uh, the Cross and the Crescent. Cross and the Crescent. Yeah, and the other one would be uh, the Abrahamic Faves. The Abrahamic Faves. And they can go to DirksOnlineBooks.com as yes. they see it written on the screen. And we look forward to, inshallah, God willing, having you back again. Thank you very much for My helping pleasure. us clear up this topic. And I'd like to thank you for sitting tight through another episode of The Dean Show. We really hope sincerely that you got to benefit. We are not afraid that you open your mind and study. Look into your own book, but do that. Really form an investigation. Take a time out from the rat race of life, from the materialism, and chasing the dollar, and being a slave to the dollar, and to a man, and to a woman. Be a slave to your creator. Sincerely, humbly, ask him to guide you. We say that the Qur'an is the verbatim word of God. We're not going to force it upon you. If you've been a, have an attachment to the Bible, look into it. Look into it from a different light. And you'll see the consistency that God has always sent messengers. And they didn't come with this theology philosophy that God is coming to die for the sins of the world. They came with the same message that there's only one God. Surrender, submit to Him sincerely in peace. And this is summed up in one word, Islam. And one who does this and makes this conscious decision is what? A Muslim. So we believe that all the messengers was Muslim. And that's it for this episode of The Dean Show. We hope to see you next week again, inshallah, God willing. Until then, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. It's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me Oh Allah you see, oh Allah you know All the sins I do I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart I'm your sinful slave you're my loving Lord I'm the one who runs away Oh Allah guide me